And so let me formally uh, kick off this event, um, which should be an absolutely amazing one. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, Anton Bukov, uh, who is a co-founder of One Inch Network uh, and um, a, uh, one of the, the kind of the, the, the best builders, best developers, quite frankly, in the space. Uh, he he is, is not too old a man. He, he was a student not too long ago at the Academy uh, of Federal uh, Security Service of Russia in Moscow, where he was a student for five years uh, and then was a developer. Uh, first in Web 2 and then, greatly, in Web 3, uh, where uh, he, um, as far as I can see chronologically, uh, started in hackathons in some point in 2018, perhaps a little bit before, uh, and um, did, I have 15 down, I think, I, I probably think you did many more hackathons than that, Anton, uh, winning lots of them and gradually building out one inch, uh, which um, has done amazing things uh, and is one of the biggest, and I, I, I'm, I'm start off with AMM platform, but quite frankly, does so many more things um, than, than that now. Um, that is one of the biggest exchanges, one of the biggest um, uh, kind of, uh, in general, DeFi platforms you want to go to and, and use. Um, and uh, they launched, uh, they had a big uh, Taken launch last year uh, on Christmas Day. Uh, not that we like talking about tokens too much, but I do remember Christmas Day and it was jolly good fun and a lovely event for everyone, uh, which I'm sure some of you also participate in that as well. So Anton, thank you so much for being here. I, I always start with the same question. When you were a student, what did you want to do with your life? Hi, everyone. Yeah, uh, thanks for the nice intro. <clears throat> yeah, uh, the question was when I was a student, what I was, uh, I, I would do or? Yeah, what did you want to do when you were, <laughs> all, uh, what was your aim in life? You know, uh, actually when I was in school, not uh, in university, uh, I was wondering like uh, who I wish to become uh, because uh, you have to apply to university, you have to choose university, you have to choose direction. Uh, I, I started uh, writing software uh, when I was like uh, three or four year, years uh, till ending the school. Uh, but uh, when I was in the last class, I was not sure who I, I, I would like to be. <clears throat> And at the, like in the middle of the year, I recognized that I really like uh, doing writing software. I, I did it like for um, tens uh, of hours weekly. It's, it's like a real job, like 20, 30, 40 hours a week. Uh, and I recognized that, wow, it's, but I, I can be a programmer. <laughs> it's a real job. <laughs> so. <laughs> I can do it not only for fun, but I can uh, use it as a main work. I can become a programmer. It was uh, so, some kind of uh, discovery <laughs> for me because uh, initially I was thinking about being uh, maybe a mathematician or maybe physics, or I was not sure who I, I was uh, uh, like uh, wish to be, <clears throat> uh, but I like it uh, all this uh, science thing and uh, programming and uh, yeah so, so I, I applied to uh, Institute of uh, Cryptography and Mathematics yeah it's uh, yeah and uh, most of my like career I, I was working with uh, like native languages like C++ um, also, I spent many years uh, shipping for iOS, so Apple devices, Apple software. It was pretty cool because uh, Apple, they provide pretty cool software for developers. All, all these instruments for developers, they're pretty cool. When you work on some uh, project, you, are not, you don't care about your instruments because they just work great. And then in 2017, uh, I like switched uh, my direction from uh, iOS to blockchain to writing smart contracts. Uh, I um, applied to a job of uh, being a smart contract developer, but I had no experience at that moment. Uh, and I uh, went to hackathon in Russia, in Kazan. And Vitalik Buterin was, was there. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I was like interested in all this and tried to build something. It was like my very, very first time when I built program for Ethereum. It was my very first 
smart contract. So I was curious about how this technology works, how, how can I write software, how I can execute it. Uh, and uh, um, maybe I wrote one of the most complex smart contracts in my life, <laughs> like this hackathon. <laughs> um, right, right now I can just like only imagine it. It was pure insane, you know? Uh, this smart contract, which I wrote, uh, it, it was uh, for outsourcing vanity Bitcoin address generation. Uh, smart contract on Ethereum was able to get tasks with payments in Ether from users and uh, miners who can um, brute force private keys, they can brute force private keys to find your vanity address. For example, your Bitcoin address could start with one Anton Bukov and uh, something else at the end. Uh, initially, it sounds like uh, absolutely unsafe that someone is brute forcing private keys for you, but uh, it, it works with a, a special cryptographic scheme. Uh, when you create your task for uh, finding some specific uh, Bitcoin address with some prefix, you also put public key of your task. You can you should create private key and not disclose it to anyone and you should disclose public key and those who have uh, nice gpus and want to work for this reward they can brute force private keys compute public keys for these private keys add their public keys to your public key of your task and then uh, compute the address of bitcoin address and if it's cool enough it have some prefix which you wish to pay for uh, miners will provide this uh, private key to smart contract. Smart contract will compute public key from private key. will add two public keys to each other and then compute this Bitcoin address and check if it have some specific prefix. And when you receive this private key from smart contract, anyone can see this private key. You should add this private key, which everyone knows, to private key, which you used initially, which is like super secret. And when you add some secret number to some public number, you would get secret number. Very good. <laughs> um, let, let's talk about um, hackathons because they're clearly important in your journey. Um, you went around the world doing like every hackathon for two years. What was that like? How did you do your job as well? How did you pay for it? Did the hackathons pay for it themselves by winning prizes? What was that experience like? Yeah, you know, um, I started participating in hackathons far uh, before blockchain hackathons started. Uh, I participated uh, like in hackathons in Russia, some Yandex hackathons <coughs> and some others. And uh, when in 20, at the end of 2018, we decided, we recognized with Sergey that uh, there are blockchain hackathons around the globe. Um, it, it's also mentioned to Worth that in 2018, in September, we met each other with Sergey uh, online. We have a common friend of us uh, who live in Germany, lived in Germany. And uh, we were like uh, chatting with Sergey in Telegram. And uh, in, in September of 2019, we started uh, doing uh, security audits of smart contracts in uh, live stream, I was like one years, uh, I had one years of uh, software, of smart contract development experience. And we started doing audits. It was some kind of hype at that moment. And we like fight it against all these uh, Ponzi schemes in uh, Ethereum. So <clears throat> we were trying to find uh, if there is any backdoors uh, which administrators could use to steal money. Um, are there any bugs which anyone could use to steal money or block funds forever or something like this? You could imagine each security audit is like three to four hours uh, long video where we read each line <laughs> of code and describe how it works. And we also know that some people who were our viewers, they became like, uh, they were developers and they became smart contract developers uh, after our audits. And we had more than 100 security audits and live streams delivered in half a year. It, it was really exhausting for us because- That's insane. Each, 
we did this audit like once per uh, three, four, two days, and it was really exhausting. But at the end of 2018, we recognized that there are a lot of uh, blockchain hackathons around the globe. Most of them are from ETH Global, uh, who are also sponsored by Ethereum Foundation. And uh, we decided to try. Uh, I, I had some experience in hackathons previously, so I told Sergey that we should try. <laughs> and we uh, went to our first hackathon in Singapore in December. And uh, uh, it was uh, pretty fun. We built some cool thing, uh, which was like in the middle of Kyber network, uh, set protocol and MakerDAO. Uh, it was like uh, automatic portfolio builder smart contract, which allows you to build uh, your set from components uh, using Kyber. You can swap oh, your oh, other. That, right? I'm going to paste a link to it. I found that. Depot set. Yeah, possibly, possibly it was the name of uh, our uh, solution. And yeah, yeah we, we won, um, as far as I remember, we won three bounties from MakerDAO, uh, token sets, and Kyber. And uh, we recognized that uh, prizes, they could cover costs of uh, this trip because uh, Singapore is uh, far away from Europe and uh, <laughs> Uh, tickets cost uh, cost a lot, but uh, we decided that uh, we can try. And uh, w what we saw that we won enough bounties to cover this, to cover these tickets and hotel. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it was not profitable in terms like we did not earn nothing on top, but it was self sustainable. It was a little bit also hard to explain to our families what we're doing, why we're like wasting our time uh, th this way, like spending four to five days uh, somewhere, a return fully like drained. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we, we describe it, wh why we need it. And uh, because it allowed us to build, uh, to build uh, like our, one second. <laughs> he can join the AMA too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's not speaking English yet, but she's learning English in school. I saw today she learned like colors. Can, has she, is she learning at Solidity as well? <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, I, I believe Solidity should be maybe six plus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. At, at least. Um, let's, let's move on. So what, which hackathon, was it East New York in 2019 that One Inch came to life? Where was the hackathon where you were like, shit, One Inch is the big thing here. We have to do this. Yeah, it, it was on East New York. I participated remotely. Sergey was in New York. Uh, it was pretty hard to make US visa at that moment. And uh, right now <laughs> it's even more complicated because uh, the visa queue is like six months or something like this. It, it's impossible. Uh, some people do visas using other countries, like it, it's too complicated, you know? And uh, yeah, we mm, had a, uh, Always, when we came to some hackathon, we have some ideas, like two or three ideas, what we could build there. And uh, on each hackathon, we were not like prepared to build something concrete because uh, we saw sometimes people, they do participate as a team who already have something in mind or maybe something pre-built and they finish this thing as a like sprint. Uh, but we were not like this kind of uh, mindset. We were like, uh, let's go and build something. <laughs> uh, we have like few ideas in mind. Maybe it would be like this or this or, or in this direction. And uh, on the hackathon, it was like we spent first one or two hours to decide what actually we would build. And uh, uh, we also uh, met a lot of people on these hackathons, a lot of hackers, and we participated on some hackathons. We united with some of them to build together. Uh, I'm not sure on East New York, 
I don't remember that anyone uh, helped us. Yeah, but yeah, we came up to idea that uh, it, it was uh, from uh, real user pain. I was like a Dex user, and uh, time to time I swapped some amount of tokens, like swapping a few hundred bucks of one token, selling it, or buying different token for one thousand of bucks. And uh, I had an issue with this because I always check at three websites, Uniswap, uh, Kyber, uh, and Bancard. And uh, depending on uh, which DEX you would select, you could get difference in, for example, 20 bucks. When you're swapping 300 bucks, you could get 20 bucks more if you just select the proper DEX. It was super strange. And uh, I was made to check all the prices on all DEXs. And our initial uh, first step was to uh, have web page where we show prices from all the DEXs, all three DEXs. At that moment, there were like three major DEXs in Ethereum, Bancor, Kyber, and Uniswap. And uh, uh, after we had this, it was a pretty simple step. We recognized that we could aggregate. Uh, it's, uh, this idea is also pretty simple, but you, you have to understand it, you know? The more you swap on each DEX, the worse is the rate. Th this means that if you would split your volume among multiple DEXs, you would swap less amount and you would get a better rate. But you have also to take gas costs into, into account. It's uh, like uh, make no sense to improve price and earn one bucks if you would spend 10 bucks on gas fees. Uh, that's what one inch do right now if one inch propose you uh, some road which is pretty complex and could cost you like five times more than on Uniswap, this means that benefit or advantage it gives to you with a result token would cover this uh, extra cost. Yeah, so the initial idea of one inch was just split among multiple DEXs. But uh, after one and a half year, like when we released version two in December of previous year, we uh, built much more complex solution right now. It, uh, if you would put some huge numbers in input boxes, like if you try to swap 1,000 of either or 10,000 of either, uh, or you could try also decrease gas price, you would see pretty beautiful road. It can aggregate among like tens of different pools or even 50 pools. <laughs> and, uh, uh, this task of finding best price, it's actually finding best road from one token to another token over other tokens and over multiple DEXs. Very nice. I've pasted the original um, project from DevPost on it as well on the chat for anyone that wants to check it out. Um, awesome. I'm going to take some questions from the chat now. Um, so the first question is, what is your favorite hackathon project you did apart from one inch? Um, I, I don't think this question could, could you repeat please? One, yeah, it's this one. I'll put it again. What is the favorite one you did that, uh, except for one inch? Uh, you, you know, uh, one more interesting uh, thing from like cryptographic point of view was something which we built on in Paris in February of uh, 2019. Yeah, no, 2020, February of 2020. Oh, maybe 2019, okay. I, I don't remember <laughs> exact year, okay. Uh, uh, we met our team there and we uh, described them and uh, in detail this flash loan thing which they implemented uh, later. Uh, and uh, we also built QR token thing. Um, right now, I think it could work because it's like self-sustainable D app, like web page and smart contract. The idea was pretty cool that you could uh, generate a lot of QR codes and uh, submit the, uh, all of them with single short transaction. And it's no matter how much QR codes you printed, 1000 or, 10,000, your transaction will be same gas uh, cost, like uh, same gas complexity. And you could give away these QR codes to people around you and they will be able to scan this QR code and get some token reward. It's like 
uh, airdrop in reality. It's like uh, non-online, offline airdrop. You could print like uh, 10,000 uh, QR codes and give away them on some event. These people will be able just to scan with their phones. They will open web page and press the button to grab this uh, reward. And the coolest thing about this is the, the cryptographic scheme used behind to avoid any front running uh, or any other thing. So it's like secure way to give away um, uh, airdrop in real life. Very nice. Um, so if anyone has questions they want to ask face-to-face, um, -face, please raise your hand on the, uh, on the Zoom. But I'll ask another question from chat because we've got so many. The next question is, what do you think of the quality of audits in crypto as someone who did a lot of audits previously? What we see regarding the auditors, we see that there are like, uh, we in one inch, we, we see like three types of auditors. It's like top companies, everyone knows them, audits cost uh, are super high and the time slots are far away from now. Uh, it's like uh, you have to wait many months to get a time slot. Uh, everyone knows these companies, uh, I believe, like yeah. top tier companies in uh, DeFi uh, and audits. Uh, there are some mid companies uh, and uh, also there is like a third kind uh, is individuals, like promising individuals, hackers who can uh, give you available feedback. And what we usually do in one inch, we usually uh, order a lot of audits. Like we have uh, more than 10 audits for our main smart contract aggregation protocol. And uh, what we try to do, we try to collaborate with as many auditors as possible. And then uh, for the next audits, uh, choose some kind of subset of auditors, which feedback was like most valuable for us. Uh, and uh, this is some kind of uh, selection of auditors. Uh, I, I would not uh, tell you who are uh, like our favorite auditors, maybe, <laughs> because uh, they will have less time slots. <laughs> That's not good for us. Yeah, but some auditors, they also came up to new like model. They do a subscription model you can get like fixed number of uh, people and fixed number of hours every month and you should pay monthly. It's like subscription. Uh, it's also pretty cool idea right now. So yeah, we have uh, some subscriptions right now. Very nice. Um, what do you think of Uniswap V3, says Takiro? Mm. It's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, uh, I believe no one expected what exactly version 3 would bring to us until it was released, uh, like one month ago or more. Uh, and recently it was launched uh, yesterday, as far as I remember. Uh, what I see how it differs from uh, version 2 and from Balancer. Oh, fi finally, finally, Uniswap is differs from Balancer because uh, Uniswap version 2 is... Uh, same thing as balancer it's like uh, one of the cases of balancer where there are just two tokens and equal proportions but v3 is a absolutely different project we see that it have higher capital efficiency but uh, we also see that it became like a tool for sophisticated market makers it not for it's it's not for regular users uh, most of the users who don't like have deep insight and deep understanding of the odd of what they are doing, they would uh, trade uh, uh, not not so not so good. So they could put liquidity. Then they will extract and see what happened to their portfolio. Uh, they could put one token and extract another token. And uh, if they would try to move their position, they can also lose money. So. Uh, to manage your position in Uniswap, you have to be sophisticated market maker. You have to understand how it works and how to earn on it. Um, maybe right. that's not that, that's not good for some kind of liquidity providers, but 
that's like a uh, cost of capital uh, increased capital efficiency yeah i also found out that uh it's pretty cool how they do manage their uh their positions like positions of multiple users they are not intersecting anymore they are not fungible and uh this uh, uh liquidity uh put it in different ranges uh, it also implemented as a uh, O1 complexity. I mean, if you put some liquidity in some range, uh, your gas cost would not depend on the range size. It, it's pretty cool achievement. Uh, and we see that they also uh, distribute the rewards to liquidity providers like uh, fees. They distribute it uh, same way as uh, uh, farming smart contract do distribute farming rewards. Um, I think you heard of it in 2020. It was uh, pretty cool that uh, a lot of projects used this farming thing to bootstrap their like liquidity of their tokens. And uh, yeah, initially the idea was uh, uh, proposed by Synthetix in the middle of 2019. And at the end of 2019, I uh, contacted them and proposed them to implement staking smart contract instead of uh, sending reward manually to all the liquidity providers to make staking smart contract and compute rewards for each second. Uh, yeah, I, I with colleague implemented this for Synthetix and in 2020, in 2020 we saw a lot of like food projects, food tokens and uh, they were all uh, using this farming thing and uh, uh, it, it, it's cool. It's just uh, it, it just works for market, and maybe this uh, crypto cycle started with all these uh, high APYs, all this uh, degen stuff. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, how would you improve Solidity as a language? Says Sean. Uh, if we would talk about Solidity, uh, yeah. How would you improve it? Uh, you know, uh, we have to talk not only about language itself, but also about compiler thing. Um, what we see in one inch, uh, compiler is not as advanced as we wish to see it. Uh, sometimes it generates code which requires a lot of guess and we like can't understand how it could be so high <laughs> gas usage. Uh, and some optimizations, like uh, it seems like stupid from our point of view, but they work and uh, it's a little bit insane uh, because most of our like uh, team members who work on smart contracts, they have experience with uh, languages like close to hardware, like C++. When you write code, you can understand how it will be uh, compiled to, to what, w what will be like exact by code, how it would work. like. Uh, what are price of all your abstractions? Uh, C++ uh, have zero cost abstractions <laughs> and uh, Rust uh, language as well. So that's why we ha would like to have like granularity control and understanding or, on uh, how this would work from compiler point of view, but it works differently. And uh, yeah, but we, we, we think Solidity is the most suitable language for smart contracts programming. Very good. Right, let's take some face-to-face -face questions. Uh, let's go for Jack from the University of Cardiff. Go on, Jack. Hi, uh, Anton, thanks for joining us today. So my uh, question would be around the sort of risks. So I, I would imagine in your mind, you would be sort of cognizant of the, ri the main risks that face one inch. I'm just wondering what um, and these could be sort of from competition or technical related and so on or strategic. Um, but I'm just wondering what your leading risks would be in the short, medium and long term. Um, it, so those sort of three categories would be interesting. Um, yes, yeah, so, sorry, I, I missed some words like, uh, but was it a question about risks of uh, running company or the risk of smart contracts? So, so, Sort of, sort of in in general. So one inch as a, a as a as an entity, I guess, um, whether it's your products or your business in general. Um, what are the sort of leading uh, challenges or difficulties that you see in the short, yeah. medium, and longer term? Yeah, if we would talk about like a business thing, uh, 
I, I think proper structure of uh, entities is uh, uh, good to have because uh, else you would have uh, troubles uh, with uh, some countries and regulations. Uh, in one inch, we have a uh, one inch foundation, and also we have a uh, one inch uh, uh, labs, like one inch labs, uh, who, who is like one of the teams uh, which is uh, like working for one inch network. And uh, from legal perspective, uh, it's also a matter to understand that one inch is not like an exchange, it's uh, not like managing user funds. It's informational service, which provides uh, aggregated information for users and users, they use this information with their own wallet to execute their transactions. So the most important thing from my point of view here is that one inch is not like middleware uh, between user and service. One inch is like informational service, which provides uh, actual data, API data, to users and they execute this data on their own wallets, on their own uh, connection to blockchain to know. Very good. Thanks, Jack, for the question. Um, let's go to uh, Jake from the University of Leeds. Over to you, Jake. Hello, Anton. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, yeah, mine's just a quick one. Um, obviously, as a student, you did a lot of hackathons. Um, but what does one inch do for like students? Do you run many internships or do you hire straight from graduation? You know, how can students get involved with one inch? Uh, you, you, you know, uh, right now we on one inch network website, one inch.io, uh, we have also application form for individuals and for teams uh, to contribute uh, somehow to one inch network. It could be like different contribution. It could be help with some uh, text. Uh, it, it could be development of web. It could be development of smart contracts. Uh, and uh, how we see one inch network, it's like distributed and decentralized thing. And one inch labs is just one of the teams who uh, deliver uh, things. And uh, uh, also, uh, one inch uh, network, uh, one inch foundation are gonna announce their uh, uh, also uh, uh, will uh, disclose uh, the, the grants program and uh, uh, like few more teams are gonna join one inch network to develop different decentralized things. And uh, there are like multiple ways to contribute and to apply. You could apply as an individual contributor, as a team contributor. You could uh, apply to One Inch Labs. Uh, uh, we have a list of vacancies. Uh, and uh, there are like so many ways to contribute. <laughs> for, for example, uh, we uh, saw that uh, someone built a pretty cool dashboard regarding the one inch token staking in uh, Ethereum network and uh, BC network. We tried to contact a developer to propose him a grant and uh, to ship this thing uh, to one inch uh, dashboard. Uh, we, we not succeeded yet in contacting him, <laughs> but we will try. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Jake. Maybe we'll also see uh... One inch in an encode hackathon soon as well. We'd love to see yeah. that. Uh, also, yeah, we are gonna support uh, hackathons for sure. And uh, one more thing, we're gonna publish some uh, tasks on Gitcoin. We like had this in mind uh, for a long period, but we didn't have enough time <laughs> for for doing this. Awesome, uh, very good. Right, let's go to Ivan uh, from in Barcelona. Over to you, Ivan. Thank you, Anton, for sharing your time. Uh, I'm building a prediction market on top of Avalanche. And I would like to know from your point of view, what are the missing features, if, if any, of the current prediction markets or any suggestion from, from you? Thank you. Uh, as far as I understand, you mean uh, missing piece in technology for yes. current markets? Yes, the, the, the thing is, all, all yeah. we now 
polymarket, uh, Gnosis, Ogur. Uh, do you find oh, th there is any feature that it, they are missing or anything to approx to users that they are missing? Maybe not, no? but well, I yeah, appreciate yeah. Any, any suggestion from, from you. Yeah, uh, I, I think currently like the, the most uh, promising thing where uh, a lot of different sub products could be shipped, but then are not shipped yet. It's derivatives, and uh, you should uh, look at companies like Opium and uh, some others. They are also trying to collaborate with each other to um, to uh, to talk to users to describe them the risks they. Uh, would like to came up to uh, same notation, like same names of this risk, like smart contract risks, uh, like uh, price manipulation risks and uh, everything like this. And uh, they, uh, for example, Opium Network, they launched uh, several products, but I, th I believe there are like a lot of, a lot of things that could be launched. It's like they provided uh, insurance for USDT token that it will not, its price will not fall more than for like two percentages below one USD. They, they launched some uh, insurance on some uh, compound APY that it will not fall less than five percentages annually. And uh, uh, some of these products, they are like order book based and some of them are pooled like uh, participation in pooled models is uh, much easier for users. They just put their money into one of few pools and don't care about what's happening. They have to just understand risks uh, and uh, w cases in which they earn and lose their money. And uh, I believe there are like so many different cases which could be and should be covered. Like uh, I did not like uh, I, I saw some projects, but I, I believe it could be more projects about insurance. It's also der derivatives. In insurance from uh, smart contract hack risks. Uh, I believe that auditors uh, could uh, have some stake in, in these uh, models also. Or it's also possible that some uh, insurance companies will order security audits uh, to to be able to provide like a ch um, like a better rates than any other um, mm -hmm. insurance companies because when they compete with each other, uh, having more audit will give them benefit. Uh, they could even have uh, uh, some audits which they are not gonna to disclose. It, it's possible. Thank you, thank you, much appreciated. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, let's go to Trevon uh, for his question now. Thank you, uh, Anton, for your time. I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, I know we talked about Uniswap v3 earlier. Um, I think it's kind of interesting how they're using uh, non-fungible tokens to represent their LP positions. And I want to ask what is kind of your take on how NFTs will be leveraged in the future, kind of outside or past art? Um, you know, NFT is a pretty interesting thing. Uh, it's called like non-fungible, but actually in DeFi, anything is fungible because you can make uh, owner of this NFT tokenized and you can have multiple owners like fractional ownership of NFTs, have some governance on top of this to allow them to vote to sell this uh, NFT at some price or they could first uh, come, put their assets into it and vote to buy some NFT. Uh, so actually NFTs, they're not so non-fungible as uh, everyone thinks, but the thing behind each NFT is like unique, uh, unique ownership among something digital. Uh, m most of the digital things, they're like, easily reproducible, like images, uh, music, video, they could be easily copied. But what could not be copied, this ownership, like, uh, and uh, uh, digital assets, they're also non-copyable. You can just copy your Bitcoins from one wallet to another. <laughs> and uh, the same thing with uh, NFTs. 
this uh, digital ownership. Uh, I, I believe we, we could see more use cases with uh, them uh, in DeFi. Uh, for example, I, I did not sure that anyone uh, built uh, some kind of uh, money market like lending protocol uh, with uh, NFTs. Um, for example, you know that ENS, ENS, it's a firm naming system. It's also tokenized using uh, NFTs. And you, you can have your Twitter nickname. Uh, you can uh, pay it for every year, year and you, you can have it. And uh, maybe it's a good idea to allow people to borrow digital currency using their NFTs, like ENS names. It's like identity. And uh, if, for example, someone would try to borrow, for example, I can uh, put my liquidity in some protocol and uh, confirm that I would like to give it to people who are like uh, some founders of some uh, top, top DeFi projects, like top 100 DeFi projects. And uh, then Stani from Aave will come and try to borrow. He will pay some interest, but it will be, uh, he will have position without collateral because collateral is his identity his ENS name, uh, because like <clears throat> everyone believes that Stani will return some amount of money. Like uh, th there could be some limits, like few hundred thousand of bucks. Community could think that Stani is a reliable person to give him few hundred thousand of bucks without any collateral with some uh, APY interest. Awesome, great question, an amazing answer once again. Uh, let's go to uh, Joseph, uh, who is in South Africa. Uh, over to you, Joseph. Hi, thanks, Anthony. Hi, Anton. I just want to know, as a DEX, what's been sort of your experience with the, you know, the use of pricing oracles, and what do you think um, is the, you know, future scaling and 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 throughput with regards to the oracles going forward, especially in a multi-blockchain world. Yeah, you know, Oracle thing uh, is uh, one of my favorite because I don't really like to use Oracles. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you know, uh, smart contracts, this is well, blockchains and smart contracts. This is insane thing. Uh, it's first in the human uh, history e executor, which is absolutely honest. It just compute mm, what it was given. It's not like some Facebook server which can just decide to ban you and uh, uh, delete, delete your profile. So we have this universal executor, but it is limited. It can't get data outside of blockchain on, on, on his own. And uh, uh, some teams, they are building projects which allow some consensus of subset of interested users to find some consensus about some external events, like external prices, uh, external events that something happened. Uh, for example, new president of United States was elected and uh, they could bring this data onto, onto blockchain and some people can uh, win their new money, some, some um, digital assets. Some people can lose their digital assets because they use some kind of protocol like Augur or Gnosis or something like this. Uh, and uh, there is like a threshold um, of uh, reliability of all this data because there is some kind of subset of users of this blockchain who are interested in bringing this data and uh, they're interested in uh, keeping this data true. And uh, uh, th they will be, uh, if, if data will not be correct, they also can lose some uh, digital assets. So they're like uh, hi highly involved in this. Uh, and a lot of projects, they work without these uh, um, oracles, but some of projects, they do require this thing. For example, uh, projects like Oracle uh, or Augur Gnosis, they, they just can't work without uh, external oracles. Uh, but some projects like Uniswap, like Balancer, uh, like Curve, and um, mostly most of AMMs, they do work without oracles and they're like 
price forming DEX. So price is established and uh, uh, arbitrage traders, they do arbitrage with this separate market to establish a uh, uh, true price on it uh, because they have incentive to the, do this, they earn. If they see that price is not correct on Uniswap, they have incentive to buy something cheap and sell it in uh, any other place or, or sell something which costs more. It's like uh, the same process. So uh, I, I believe that uh, there are some, there is like some set of different projects which are dependent from oracles, uh, but it's also a, a trade-off. Uh, most of these oracles, they work on, on chain and uh, this also a huge cost of, of gas. Um, it's also not really good <laughs> for them. Th this, their validators, they spend a lot on bringing, this, on bringing this data to the blockchain. So it, <laughs> it's not like it, my a really favorite topic, but uh, I, I, uh, if I have like multiple uh, versions on, on how to deliver something, I would try to build it without uh, any external dependent dependencies uh, like oracles. But if it's not possible to build without oracles, definitely you, you should build it using oracles. Awesome, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, let's take some questions from the uh, chat. Um, one person asks, what are your favorite projects in crypto apart from one inch ones? Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, in DeFi, there are many, many different projects and uh, some of them are pretty cool. I, I started to investigate uh, all the projects like a couple of years ago. And uh, in 2018, 2019, 2020, we saw a lot of projects. They were like launched and they got their initial traction. And then they uh, started maybe launching their token, maybe... Uh, rising crown, something like this. But the, the, the more we fall into this uh, crypto summer thing, uh, the more we see projects which are like rising money, issuing token without uh, having uh, like uh, MVP, without having uh, traction. So it's like uh, bec uh, be became uh, like a little bit dangerous again to fall into all these projects. And uh, what's, what I see on the market now, it's, it, it goes so fast that every, every day, almost every day, new projects appear and uh, appearing. It, uh, it's hard uh, to track them all. So I just mostly know most of the projects who will launch it in 2019, 2020, because they launched it like few projects in, in a month. It, it was like enough time to understand which uh, projects, uh, what, what they are doing. Uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, some projects right now, like uh, Opium, Opium Network, they're doing derivatives and they're like exploring this uh, pool, pool participation thing. Uh, I, I really like it and uh, hope to use them on my own at, at some point. Um, I, I also, see uh, there, there are like some projects uh, who uh, build like new kind of AMMs. Uh, and uh, the thing is <clears throat> when we started in one inch, we had like three different AMMs, uh, but right now we have more than 53 different DEXs in Ethereum mainnet. It's a super huge amount and uh, what I think uh, most of these projects were not able to survive without aggregators because even if they failed in user acquisition, they could succeed if their technology is good. Uh, they would get their uh, fair volumes from aggregators. Fair volumes in terms of uh, how good are prices they could offer. Awesome. Um, Kirill asks, um, what steps do you recommend after winning a hackathon to becoming a successful DeFi project? How do you find investors, team members? What was the one inch method? Uh, 
you, you know, uh, I'm not sure how to win hackathons because yeah. on, on this East New York hackathon where we built one inch, we completely like lose it. <laughs> uh, we, we won a um, prize from ENS because they were giving this uh, 300 bucks to anyone who just include uh, ENS instead of uh, user wallet. Uh, you, you just show ENS name in the corner instead of uh, user address and you get it, 300 bucks. So we not succeeded. It was like the, the less successful our participation in hackathon in terms of uh, bounties. We got one bounty from ENS, 300 bucks. It was not enough to cover uh, tickets for sure. Uh, but uh, we, we, we like uh, we were happy about uh, project because we recognized that it, it works for us. This means that it could work for a, a, anyone else. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I would suggest uh, try to win. But if you don't succeed, this not means that you build something uh, not uh, not worthy. It, it's like. Uh, what we really tried to achieve on, achieve on each hackathon, we tried to build like a fully sustainable application, like some smart contracts, some web front end, and we launch it and it works like, like on GitHub pages. We don't need even server to run this uh, web page. And uh, most of our hacks, they right now are working. You can find them somehow in the, uh, I believe most of them could work right now. Maybe they have bugs, so they're like not stable, but they can work. And uh, we try to build something sustainable each time. I, I think it's meaningful because uh, if you build something as a like a finalized product, which can work, uh, you, you can show it to people. They can understand and you could get your very, very first traction. Awesome. Um, next person asks, how did you find investors? Was it hard? Um, yeah, in, initially I believe it was hard. Uh, at the end of uh, 2020, like in September of 2020, oh no, it, it was not, it was 2019. At the end of the 2019, we, we tried to find investors, but it was hard. <clears throat> we, on each call, we show it like uh, our uh, pitch deck, we like try to under describe our like business model, how it would work. Some investors uh, told us what you are gonna do with money. You have a working service. What else do you want? <laughs> it was uh, pretty strange to hear. Uh, in 2019, it it was like they were not really interested. Investors, they were not inter interested. They were like looking having a call with you, but they were not ready to give you money. Uh, but what we saw in 2020, all this like hype started and uh, uh, they became more active, all, all these investors. I believe this called market sentiment when market conditions, uh, they stimulate investors to find projects more actively. And uh, I, I believe this was like a moment when we recognized that uh, it's not interview for us at some point, it was more interview for investors. And we asked them like, what, what can you uh, value add to our project? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm conscious of time. So maybe one final question. What is your recommendations for students now to get involved in blockchain? Is it do hackathons? Is it just focus on university and learn good computer science? Uh, is it learn solidity? What was your recommendation for students to do for getting into blockchain? <clears throat> to software engineers who are interested in developing something for blockchain, I would recommend uh, to learn algorithms like uh, really deep because uh, this thing is uh, really matters. There are like some uh, people who believe that project could be built just right on some vision but I don't believe in this. I believe that each product which is on market, there is some cool technical solution behind it. And I'm not sure that it's possible to propose some cool project without having this cool solution first. Uh, 
I, I believe that this technical solution appears in mind and then project is built upon on it. Uh, it it's o o only in this direction. So for engineers, algorithms and software patterns, software development patterns are the most important. And uh, yeah, all this solidity thing, uh, I, I would recommend to read more, more smart contracts of other projects like Uniswap version one, Uniswap version two. It's like great examples, which could be uh, anyone can understand their code, I, I believe. Like I am talking about software engineers. Anyone, any software engineer could uh, read smart contracts, but uh, not write because uh, I mean, it's possible to write, but uh, you have to order also security audits. It's not possible to uh, have a self security audit. It's just not possible. Even like top hackers in DeFi, they uh, believe that it's it's not possible. Awesome. Well, uh, I think we'll end the event there. Anton, that was amazing. Like honestly, fantastic. Uh, the depth of your answers, the insights and the, the care you put in with every answer was uh, I think much better than the usual per, per kind of answer. And we have had lots of kind of entrepreneurs and investors. And yeah, I think the depth of your answers was one of the best we've seen. So thank you so much for not only that, but your time this afternoon. I know you're an extremely busy man. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for hosting me. <laughs> awesome uh thank you everyone to, who joined and who asked the questions uh next week we have uh, a getting hired in DeFi event uh so please do come along to that george will put the link into the uh into the chat but in the meantime everyone uh, thank you for joining us today anton thank you so much again and see you all very soon thank you very much guys